Okay, good morning everyone, and we are continuing over here in Tehillim, and we're holding over here by a new one today. We're in Lamid Vav 36. Now, this Tehillim is going to be broken up into two distinct parts. The first part is going to focus on the Rishayim, the wicked, and the elements in their life which bring them to Rishas, which bring them to wickedness. Primarily, we're going to discuss the nitty-gritty of the Yetzirah, of the evil inclination. And then the second half of the Tehillim is going to be the life of David HaMelech and Sadiqim and the righteous, and what is the motivating force behind them to, to avoid the darkness of this world, to avoid the wickedness and the, and the impurities of this world, and cling to a path, a life of Kedusha, of Torah and of purity. So I think what we'll try to do is spend today's class going through the negative, which is going to be the Yetzirah and the, and the Rishoyim and the wicked who do things. And then Be'ez Hashem, next week, we'll get into the positive, we'll get into the world of the Tzadikim, of the righteous and, and their lifestyle. So let's go over here from the very beginning the Pasuk says, again, we're in 36, number 1, Lam Natseach Le'evid Hashem Le'david. And Lam Natseach is the victory cry of David HaMelech, Le'evid Hashem, to the servant of God, Le'david, to David HaMelech. So David is saying over here, that however we're going to look at this particular Tehillim, the difference between David HaMelech and all of the other uh, people that he's going to speak about, the, the Rishayim, the wicked people of the world, those that are immersed in the Yitzhahara, this that makes David HaMelech so unique and so special is that David is an Evid Hashem, he's a servant of God. And we find this other places in Tehillim as well, where David, he will bespeak his greatness, and he will, he will praise HaKadosh Baruch Hu for that which he has made, of, made him to be. And his, the greatest praise that David can give of himself, the greatest levels of, ac- of, of accolades that he can describe his, his nature and who he is, is that David is an Evan Hashem, he is a servant of God himself. Now, David HaMelech says, and we just had in Halil just the other day, and I think we spoke about this somewhat recently, if I'm not mistaken as well, and that is that when David HaMelech wants to, when he wants to prove his yichus, his lineage, he says, Ani avdecha, I am a servant, ben amasecha, the son of, the, of a maidservant. Which means that David HaMelech understands the, the most crowning attribute that you can have as a person in this world, as a member of Klal Yisrael, is the attribute of having the distinct honor of being called an Evan Hashem, a servant of God. Many people, everybody is a servant of something. Some of us are servants. We are enslaved to our Gashmias, to our physical world. Some of us are enslaved to the honor and the covet that we're running after. A woman once told me that every few months, she used to Google herself. She would Google her name. She wanted to see how many new things had come up on Google about her if they brought down this article, if they said over this praise that she got publicly, if they spoke about this or spoke about that. So every few months, just to make herself feel better, she used to Google herself to see what she was really, what she was worth in the eyes of the public. That's slavery. That is a person who is enslaved to the popular opinion of this world, worrying about, did enough people see me? Did they say enough about me? How many hits? How many likes, how many thumbs up does a person have? That's the world that we live in right now. The world where a person measures themselves not by what's on the inside, but they measure themselves by what the outside external uh, world has to to say about them. If there's enough thumbs up, if there's enough views, if there's enough good, good reports over there that were left on Yelp for your business, so then you must be a great person. But if you got something that was negative, or somebody put the thumbs down over there, or only 93 people looked 
at your video that you posted on your YouTube channel over there today. You thought you're going to have more people viewing your, your Meshugas. So then a person begins to feel that there's nothing there. So Dovah Melech is saying, everyone is a slave. We're slaves to everything. We're slaves to our luxuries, to our physicality, to our desires, to popular opinion, what people think about us, to our work, to our jobs, to our money, parnasa, you name it. So everyone's going to be a slave no matter what you're saying. So I, says David Amalekh, I'm also a slave, but I'm an Eved Hashem. And to be, uh, to be enslaved, to subjugate oneself, to humble oneself before our Kodesh Baruch Hu, recognizing that he is the Odo in our Kola Aretz, he is the master of the universe and he is my master. He is the one that I'm going to serve and listen to. That, says David, is, that is the great praise that he can give himself. And as we go through this Tehillim, we'll begin to recognize and to realize, as, as David is going to say, there is a wide gap between the person who will look at themselves as an Eved Hashem and as a person that will look at themselves as Nisht Eved, as not an Eved, not a servant of Hashem. An Eved Hashem will be able to stay on the straight path in life. Someone that is not going to subjugate themselves and find the schus, the merit, to be a servant of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, that's where all the issues and the difficulties in life are going to begin to fall in. So I'm going to start today with the, the, the main commentaries and the Mikras Gedailis of, the, of this Tehillim. And we'll start with, we'll start with the words of the Metzudas David. And he writes... If you look in the Pasuk, I, I have to read the second Pasuk to be able to explain it. The second verse says, Na'um pesho l'rasha b'kerev libi. He says there's a pronouncement, there's a, 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 a declaration to the Russia, to the wicked person, b'kerev libi, that speaks about the lawlessness that's in one's heart. And pachad elokim l'neged enov, and that person, this Rasha says that there's no pachet elokim, there's no fear of Hashem, l'neged enav in front of him. The, this Rasha, this wicked person that we are describing over here, he makes this announcement, whatever that announcement is going to be, as we will see, and whoever this wicked person is, and they say, basically, I have no pachet elokim, I have no fear of Hashem, I, I'm not watching HaKadosh Baruch Hu watching me, I don't believe in, in these kind of things. And therefore, I can just go and do whatever it is that I want. Says the Mitzudah's David, I think to myself in the recesses of my heart. The Yetzara is very tricky. And the Yetzara says to a wicked person, There's nobody in the world that has true pachet elokim, the fear of Hashem, in front of them. Because Hashem doesn't really watch over this world, this lowly world down here. You told me there's a rebunish on the creator and the master of the universe. He's so lofty, he's omniscient, he's great. Why in the world would HaKadosh Baruch Hu concern himself with such mundane, trivial events which are taking place down here in this lowly universe? Kodesh Baruch Hu doesn't care. And therefore, the Yetzirah tells the person, since that Kodesh Baruch Hu is not watching over us, and since that Hashem doesn't really care what we do, and He doesn't know anyway what's going on, the, the, the master of the universe certainly is, could care less about what's going on down here in this world. Therefore, go ahead, and do ma'ashe libcha chafetz, whatever your heart desires, go and do. What you're worried that what you want to do goes against the Torah? What are you worried about? You think HaKadosh Baruch Hu is watching what you do? You're worried that what you're going to say is going to be something that's construed as Lash and Hara? Listen, that was a nice book with some good ideas in there, some nice advice of how to be a, a better person in this world. But to say that the Torah is binding for all generations and that HaKadosh Baruch is actually watching and cares about what you do, says the Yetzirah, it's not true. And therefore, ma'ashalib ha'chafetz, whatever your heart desires, you want to run after taivas, you want to run after the foolishness of this world, you want to break every single sin that it says in the Torah, ain't pachet elokim neged, you don't have fear of Hashem anyway in front of you, 
because you don't believe that there's that Kodesh Baruch and I, the Yitzhah, I'm telling you, you don't have to worry about it. So therefore, a person will run, run wild. He'll let loose, as they say, and he will go and he will do that which he wants to. Now the Malbim over here has a, we haven't seen the Malbim inside in depth, maybe in, in a long time, even here in Tehillim, we're not spending so much time in the Malbim like we used to in the days of, in the days of Mishle, where we saw the Malbim every single week. But we're going to spend some time on the Malbim today because he's going to open up the world of the Yetzirah to us. <laughs> Says the Malbim, starting from Pasuk Aleph, B'mizmor zeh, in this mizmor, in this Tehillim, Yaskir Tainos Hayetze Upituyof, where it mentions the, the claims and the seduction of the Yetzirah, Eich Yechayin Chetzav Al Yeser Lirois Bamoi Oifel Tainos Belev, and now it's shooting darts and arrows into the darkest recesses of a person's heart. V'yes had tshuva is Hashem Bam Nimat Seich Oisai, and the, this Tehillim will eventually, in the second half, will begin to produce the answers that are needed to, to uh, be victorious over the Yitzhahara. That's why it says that this is a victory for the Evan Hashem. Only the Evan Hashem, David HaMelech, the servant of God, will he be able to combat and overcome and beat his enemy. And he's going to be able to remove himself and overcome this stormy war, this battle that is raging over there. With wondrous and amazing things. So the Malbim is saying over here that the Milchama, the battle that a person has with their Yetzirah constantly, is a milchama sa'ara, it is a tempest storm of battling. That is what is going on with the eight Sahara. And the only way that a person is truly going to be able to overcome this battle that the Yet Sahara has been has presented in front of him is Devarim Nifloim Venoiroim, wondrous and awesome things will have to take place in order to beat the Yet Sahara. Now, what is the first step? You got to be in Evan Hashem. A person has to be an Ever Hashem, a servant, willing to be meister, to give themselves over to HaKadosh Baruch for what he wants. Once that we hit that level, which is what David HaMelech was, or at least we're trying, we're gravitating in that direction. I look at my life and all the different things that have trapped me in their clutches. I look at all the different uh, masters that I have in my day-to-day life. Of, I'm worried about what this one thinks and what that one thinks. Do I have enough of this, enough of that? I truly am enslaved to so many things in my life. So I'd like to move past that because I want a better quality of life. I want to be free. Right? Many people think that a life of Torah and a life of mitzvahs is a life of servitude and slavery, the opposite of freedom. They think, well, if I can't tear paper, toilet paper on Shabbos, Obviously, I'm not free. Well, if I can't walk in any restaurant that I want to, eat anything that I want, obviously, I'm not free. Well, if I can't eat challah on Pesach, is it the Torah is telling me you have to eat matzah only? Obviously, I'm not free. I'm a slave to Hashem. I'm a slave. But if I could do whatever I want, then I would be then I would be free. And the answer that David is saying it's not true. Just because you can walk into any restaurant and eat whatever you want doesn't mean that you're free. It means that you are enslaved to the desire for food and you want to go and have whatever you want. Just because I have a desire to speak Lush and Hara, if I don't believe in the laws of Lush and Hara, and then I'm going to get a big clap from HaKadosh Baruch if I say uh, slander and gossip, so then I say whatever I want, I'm not a free person. I'm actually, I'm enslaved to my words and my speech and the desires that I have in my heart to destroy another human being and put other people down, all for the sake of putting myself up. So the way to go in this tempest storm of the Yetzirah is that a person needs dvarm nifloim v'neiroyim. They need wondrous, awesome, amazing strengths over here to overcome the milcham and to overcome the battle with the Yetzirah. 
And how are we going to do that? By maintaining this equilibrium of being the Evan Hashem, a servant of God. So says the Malbim the following, and he writes, Ki bichlala mitzvahis v'azhara shenosan Hashem lono yeshnei deyos. The Malbim is going to explain now to us the, the idea, the concept of mitzvahs. And he says, there are two deyos, there are two approaches, two ideas in the world of mitzvahs that we are going to discuss. Yesh oimim, there are those that say, she'inyan atore va'a mitzvah is who kemelech mitzavel avdoi. One way is, it's like a king who commands his servant, Zois tase v'zois loy tase. This you're allowed to do, and that you're not allowed to do. She'evid mechuyev l'ishmoy l'koyloi. An evid, a servant of the king, is obligated to listen to what the king says, to his voice. Why? Mibnei pachtoi umoro, because of his fear and the awe that he has of the king. He doesn't ask, why did you tell me to do this? He doesn't ask, oh, I want to understand it better. No. The master, my king, who has the power of life and death in his hands, who could punish me if he wants to and reward me handsomely if he wants to, I'm not, he's telling me to do something. I'm not going to ask him anything. Why? How? What's the reason? Why did you ask me to do such a thing, king? I have a pachet umayra, I have a fear and an awe of the power and the might of the king, and therefore I know whatever he says I have to do. It's, is it because it's good for me or bad for me? It's good for me because if I don't do it, the king's going to punish me. So I don't need to know anything. I don't even know why. Even if I don't even like the, the, the work that he's making me do, he makes me go and grind in the mill for 16 hours a day to make flowers for his royal party that's coming. I don't ask any questions. I can't complain to the king. This is my life is dependent upon this. I'm going to do it. That's one way. The second way, the Yeshem Shekol HaMitzvah is Heim L'Toel Seno. Another way to understand mitzvah is that every single mitzvah that we have in the Torah is the toel hasein, it's for our toel, it's for our benefit. The yidme es Hashem ha metzuva aleim kereife ha metzuva umasir es ha Says the Malbim HaMashal, a parable the following. And the parable is that let's look at our Kodesh Baruch who is commanding us in the mitzvahs like a doctor that is commanding and cautioning and warning his sick patient. Ma yoichel ma lo yoichel, what you're allowed to eat? what you are not allowed to eat. A sick person will listen carefully to the directions of the doctor. Why? Because of avas atzmo, because the sick man loves himself. He wants life. He wants to live. The man walks into the doctor. He's not well. The doctor runs the battery of tests on him and he finds out exactly what condition it is that he has. And the doctor says, listen, I'm an expert. I've seen this a thousand times before, if not more. And I know what you need to heal yourself. But first and foremost, you must make sure that you're eating the right combination of foods. Otherwise, it's devastating to your constitution. So whatever list the doctor gives him of foods that are permissible, and those foods that are on the X list that you're not allowed to eat anymore, since that I love myself and I value my life and I want to live, so therefore I don't have a problem listening to the doctor. I, he just said I can't eat steak. He said I can't eat chocolate cake. He said no more ice cream, no more candy, no more my favorite kugels. Okay, you know what? I'd like to live more than indulge here in this world. So therefore, so too says the Mabim, just like when the doctor gives me a list of commands that is for my benefit, for my health, for my life, and I'm willing with all my heart to do such a thing, so let's look at the mitzvahs in that way as well. The mitzvahs are a command by a Kodesh Baruch Hu who knows the Chali nefesh. He knows the maladies of our souls. He knows the weakness of our souls. He knows what we need to repair ourselves in this world. And therefore, everything that he gives us is part of the prescription to a better life. So who's not going to listen to Hashem? 
Neged at Sararish are fine. So that's the two things. Number one. Number one is I keep mitzvahs not because I have any even an idea that it's good for me, but rather I know there's Hashem. He runs the universe. He told me that there's scharva, and this is reward and punishment. If you do good, you're going to get rewarded. If you do bad, you're going to get punished. Well, that, al- that alone is enough to motivate me to keep the mitzvahs in the right way because I'd like to get rewarded, not punished. The second way, which is perhaps a, a greater insight that a person can have is, I understand that the mitzvahs that HaKadosh Baruch has given me, even though there's so many things, so many loisah says things that you're not allowed to do. And there are so many things I have to do that are hard. It's not always easy. You need mysterious nefesh. You need to push yourself. Sometimes your, your physical and your spiritual limitations. But since then I know that it's for my benefit, like the sick man who walks into the doctor's office and the doctor says, you got to take this, X, Y, and Z, eat these foods over here, those foods are on the list that you're not allowed to eat anymore because it's for what you need to live. So if every single mitzvah is, a, is designed by a Kodesh Baruch Hu to grant me a greater type of life, a satisfaction, a meaningfulness, a profound existence in this world, so then of course I'm going to keep the mitzvahs. It's for my benefit. If the master of the universe is the one that is giving me the mitzvahs and it's for my benefit, why wouldn't I do it? Why wouldn't you do it? That's what the Malcolm is going to come to say. Where does the Yetzirah? Why does a person not keep mitzvahs? Why do we struggle with basics for 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years of our life? Why do we say, no, that's not for me. That's not for me. Uh, maybe next year. Maybe two years. 20 years later, you look back. Hmm, maybe the next 20 years. Maybe that's when I'll do it. What gets us to listen? So says the Malbim the following. Hatzad Arishon, the first, under, the first approach to mitzvahs, which is HaKadosh Baruch Hu rewards and He punishes, and therefore I am humbled in front of Hashem. There's a pachad umayra. There's a fear and an awe that I have. I want to make sure I do the right thing. And that it says like this, Ein pachad elokim l'neged enav. Well, the person who doesn't have pachad elokim, the person has no fear of Hashem in front of him, so then why in the world would he keep mitzvahs? Ha says the Malbim, Ha-pachad sha'ata mefachad melokim, this fear that you have of Hashem, the onshoy and the punishment, hu darve emunai, you, you believe in such a thing? You believe that HaKadosh Baruch is watching what you're doing, and therefore if you step out of line, He's going to punish you? That is based upon one's amuna. It's based upon if you believe in such a, a concept, such an idea. But my dear friend, can you see Hashem watching you? Are, do you hear HaKadosh Baruch Hu's voice? Do you see that kubus? Do you see that pen that is writing in the book all day long, everything that you've done? Is HaKadosh Baruch Hu there on his iPhone with the triple cameras videotaping and recording everything that you do in your life? Can you show that to me? I don't see it. Do you see it? So if you, if you are going to live your life according to that idea, so you realize you're living your life based on a muna, based on faith, of something that you can't see yourself. The rabbi ma'chishim oisai, she'en pacha reindin v'cheshvan. And there are many people, there are many people there. <laughs> Go on to the internet today. Get on to any podcast that you want that is going to talk about there's no God and he doesn't watch what's going on. He has no idea what's happening. And you have all these existential uh, philosophers that are, that are shooting off their mouths because they figured out the meaning of life and they're trying to chisel away at the moon of cloud yourself day and night. Says the Malbim, go ahead. There's so many people to be machish to oppose what your moon and what your belief is. Prove it to me. Prove to me there's a Rebbein Nishailam. Prove to me that he's watching what you're doing. Prove to me that he rewards you and he punishes you. Have you seen it? Has anyone come back from the other world and told you all about it? And even if that person did come back from the other world, can you believe that it's true? Maybe they had some psychedelic, uh, who knows what was going on over there in their lives, and they came down and they said, listen, I had this wild experience, out-of-body experience. Let me tell you what happened. Was I with them in the outer world? In the other? No, I wasn't. Says the Malbim over here. So why are you so afraid of what Hashem's going to do? Why are you in such awe of the God that you can't see? Or hear? 
or smell or taste or touch? Why are you so afraid of him? Says the Malmin, um, And how come other people have no pachet, they have no fear of Hashem in front of them? So he writes, Lama, why? Why don't we do this, uh, this, this act, this bad act, meaning, why are there so many people that in this world they have no problem doing the wrong thing? No problem. You are, you are dead set. I'm going to do the right thing. Why? Because you believe that there's HaKadosh Baruch who's watching you and he hears everything that you say and he knows every little detail of your life. But there's so many people that don't care. There's so many people that have no problem quickly. They're doing things that are wrong. Why? When the Yetzara comes into the person's head and goes, starts nibbling away at the amuna that's in his heart and he starts saying to this person, look, Look at the world around you. Do you see a world of devout, re- devoutly religious people? Do you see a nation of the Jewish people where everybody's serving Hashem and keeping the mitzvahs with fear and with awe? No. We know that seven out of ten Jews in America are intermarried. We know that the amount of religious Jews in the world right now is a minimal amount, maybe one million out of the 16 million Jews that are in the world. And look around the rest of the world and you will see people acting like maniacs. So what does that mean to you? That means that obviously HaKadosh Baruch is not watching. So you came up with this concept, this idea, because you read that old book over there called the Torah. You read some of the Mepharshim, the commentators, the Ramban was living in our generation. Rashi knows what's happening in 2021 right now. He knows about technology, about phones, about WhatsApp. He knows about that. He didn't know about that. Rashi lived in France a thousand years ago. He lived under a rock. What does he know? The Rambam. The Rambam is going to tell me what to do in my life right now a thousand years later. What does the Rambam know from California? From America, from computers, from Parnassa, from business, from cars that you can press a button and the car drives itself. The Rambam didn't know about that. So you look around the world and you see for yourself that, in fact, most people do not live a life of fear and awe of Hashem. If that's the case, must be, says the Yetzar, that's a proof that HaKadosh Baruch is not running the world. That's a proof that Hashem is not watching everybody. Because if nobody has pachat, nobody has fear and awe, and people are doing everything they want, and still we see almost 8 billion people in the world today, If Hashem was so unhappy with us, why wouldn't He just start smiting people down one by one? And yet the world just keeps growing and growing and advancing and producing more and more people, more and more more and more uh, ideas and technology and and advancement. Man is advancing in the world today. So isn't that a a claim that the Yetzirah has against us? Says the Malbim over here. And it's machish, it destroys the amuna that a person has in their heart, it destroys it. That the what? There's no oinish v'ashkacha. They say, you know what? There is no punishment. I see you're right. So many billions of people in the world. According to the Torah, there's a lot of people doing the wrong things. And they're alive. They didn't get punished. And therefore, I, you know what? Yetzirah, you got a good point. There is no ashkacha. Hashem's not watching over everything. Kechol ta'inaz ha'filosifim. How you do him. All of the is all the arguments of philosophers. What are the arguments? They're constantly coming to argue this point. There is no reward and there is no punishment. You see, the philosophical world has to push their agenda very strong because they don't want to acknowledge that there's a creator in the world. Because if you acknowledge that there's a creator in this world, and as the Ramban writes in the Chumash, he's the creator, and he knows what's going on in the world, and he's mashkiach, he's watching over everything, and he's involved in order that he can reward and he can punish. So if you don't want to live with that idea, because then it's an achrais responsibility that we have to behave ourselves, so that every philosopher has to keep pushing this idea, 
well, there is really no God. And even if you say there's some kind of godly power in the world, he just got the ball rolling, but then he left us on our own. And we've got these complicated, chaotic feelings and emotions that are going on inside of us. And we have to try to get it under control because if we don't get it under control completely, we don't feel good about ourselves. So we'll just try to figure out what's going to make us feel a little bit better. What would be more humane? What would be more spiritual? What would be a more noble way to live? But it's all for ourselves, nothing to do with HaKadosh Baruch Hu. So all the philosophers and all of the naysayers of Amuna and all of these wild podcasts that are out there in the world and these people that are all over the internet right now just spewing forth heresy, it's all because they don't want to admit a basic fundamental truth. And that is HaKadosh Baruch Hu created the world. He's watching over the world. He knows everything that is going on. And he's rewarding us for the good and he's going to punish us for the bad. But when you have so much of this Yetzirah that's coming in the world, says the Malbim, it will be machish, it will weaken your own resolve of Amuna. That's why I say, just say, a person has to be so careful with what they read and what they see. If you read the books that are written by the heretics, if you listen to the conversations, you listen to their websites, to their YouTube channels, you see their debates to disprove the, the existence of HaKadosh Baruch Hu in this world, God forbid, to try to do such a thing. And they, they argue against weak-minded in, weak individuals. They will be machish, they will weaken, and they will lessen, and they will destroy one's amun. You can't read everything that you want. You can't listen to and watch everything that you want. We're here to em empower ourselves with Amuna. We're here to strengthen our hearts and our minds in belief of HaKadosh Baruch Hu to understand the basic foundations and fundamentals of what it means to be a Jew. And if we listen and we read and we go places that are antithetical to all of that, we are only damaging and hurting ourselves. Says the Malbim, that's the power of the Yetzirah. The power of the Yetzirah is that it can undermine and it can undo a person's moon in this world. So you have to be very careful. The second thing we said, the Neged Atzara Sheni, and the second thing which we said is, that the Torah and the mitzvahs that HaKadosh Baruch has given us, all of the warnings that Hashem has told us about, they're all for our benefit. And even the Seichel, the logical mind is able to comprehend that and understand that. We, be we begin to see how the mitzvahs are so much for our benefit, how they're making us greater and stronger and closer to our Kodesh Baruch Hu, lifting us up beyond the inertia of mankind, not to get bogged down by this, this superficial life that so many people are living, rather to live a life that is going to be so exalted in the world of Ruchnius. So on that, what does the Yetzirah do? How's the Yetzirah? Once that you say, no, the Torah is benefit. Every mitzvah that I do, I know it's hard sometimes, but I'm like the guy in the gym. The guy goes to the gym, he's 45 pounds overweight, he wants to get his body ripped and he wants to lose all that weight, so he's got he's to cut down on what he eats, he has to make sure that he's not eating the wrong foods, he goes on a crash course diet to get rid of all fat, and he's working out two, three hours a day. Why would you do that to yourself? Because you have a goal. Your goal is you want to look good. I also have a goal. I want to look good in the eyes of Hashem. I want to be exalted. I want to be exuberant with ruchnius, with spirituality. So it requires sacrifice. I can't eat everything that I want. I can't go every place that I want to. I can't do everything that I want. I have to be in control. Like the man who goes to work on his physique. I'm working on the physique of my neshama. It takes effort and time and hard work but I'm willing to do it. So how is the Yetzirah going to come along now and come up with some, some claims, twisted claims, that are going to push us away from that? Says the Malbim the following, and he says, on this it writes the following. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, so he says, So this is the third verse over here. That in his eyes he smoothed out the path, and he has found a way to attain his sin, the, the sinful goal. 
and, and to despise, to despise anything that is going to get in that way. Says the Malbim, and he writes the following words, Sham, Sam lefan of arachasim b'deh chalak. The, the Yetzirah, he throws things along the road in front of him to make the path to sin smooth. He begins to show you, you thought it was logical why you should do mitzvahs. You thought this beautiful mushal, wow, the Malbim came up with this great mushal over here, the doctor, the sick man comes to the doctor, the doctor says, I know what's wrong with you, so you need to eat this and you can't eat that, do this, you take this treatment, not that treatment, you get better. You think it's really seicha, you think it's so clear and simple like that, says the Malbim? It's not. You need to find the reason why it is that people hate doing sin. And what's the reason that a person will try to withhold it from themselves? Says the Malbim over here. The first claim that the Yetzirah has against the person is going against the, what's called Seichel Ayuni, which is the, is the, I don't know, we'll call it maybe the intellect of one's mind. Meaning the mind will probe the depths, plumb the depths of Amuna, of belief, of understanding there's a Rebbein Shalom who's watching over the world and there's reward in this punishment. And therefore, that first claim of the Yetzirah, that, that which is what? Look at the world around you. And you will see it's simply not true. The world is not running on this plan that you think that there is. And in place of one's amuna, the Yetzirah shows these things that are going on in the world that are a direct... Um, opposition to what the immune of this person is. The second claim of the Yetzirah, which again is going against this idea that there's a benefit in the mitzvahs that I am doing, that second claim of the Yetzirah, it's going against the actions that a person does. A person will, the Yetzirah will distinguish between the good and the bad actions that a person is doing. Says the, says the Malbim over here that what is the Yetzirah going to do the second time around? He's going to make it that the sinful behavior that a person is going to do. And then as we're going to see that this person who thought that there's benefit, he's not going to see anything happening wrong to him. He's not going to see that if he sins, he's going to suffer. He's not going to see that if he goes off the pathways of the Rebbe Nishailam, so therefore he's hurting himself. He's not hurting himself. And therefore the sin that he does will end up covering up that system of belief, which is that Torah and mitzvahs and the warnings that HaKadosh Baruch has given me is all for my benefit because I'm going to become a greater person as a result of it. Says the Malbim over here, the Yetzirah comes and he shows time and time again, it doesn't matter what you do in your life. It doesn't matter what you are involved with. Because at the end of the day, there's still 8 billion people in this world that are living just fine. There are people that are villains, they are thieves, they are thugs, they are murderers, they are drug addicts, they are low lives, they are they are they're adulterers, they are all different things. And yet, they continue to thrive, and to live, and to have a job, and they have wives, and children, and she has a good position over here, and this one and that one. And therefore, says the Yetzar, Look, just look at the world. The world is a steer, is a contradiction to your system of beliefs. Whether your belief is that you have to understand that HaGadosh Baruch is watching everything and rewarding and punishing, not true, take a look at the world. Or if you believe that the mitzvahs are for your benefit and the Averis, the sins, are for your detriment, well, look at the world is sinning day and night and 
I don't see where their life is so terrible. So says the Malbim, that's the power of the Yitzhahara. The Yitzhahara, who is the biggest late, lates, the biggest lets, the biggest scoffer in the world, he comes along and he undermines all of our belief. He undermines all of the Mesorah, Satoira, everything that we have for thousands of years, dating back to the days of Moshe Ben Har Sinai, which really goes beyond all the way to the times of Avram Avinu, when he revealed HaKadosh Baruch in this world, how the world is running. A little Yetzirah in 2021 that you found in your, in your WhatsApp video that was sent out through YouTube and Instagram and everything and Facebook, someone's posting some find on Facebook over there, that's going to undermine thousands of years of our Masora, of our belief in our Kodesh Baruch Hu based on what we have from our Sinai? Says the Malbim, yeah, that's how, how tough and that is how how, how evil the Yetzirah is, that he could be machish, he could destroy what it is that a person has in their life of Amuna. And therefore, we have to be ever so careful, says the Malbim over here, to make sure that we don't listen to what the Yetzirah has to say. You have to be very strong, because the Yetzirah is, he, he knows, you know, certain people that you talk to, they know how to talk your language. Certain, sometimes you go to a shir, it could be the world's most incredible speaker. He's billed as the greatest speaker in the world, but doesn't talk your language. So you start dozing out. I don't know what goes on behind the black screen over here, if anyone's listening or not. So you start dozing out a little bit. You start not paying attention. You're looking at your watch. You're getting a little antsy over it. You want the whole thing to end. The Yetzirah is a creation of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and he was created to speak in your language. He knows the what you like to hear. He knows what gets you thinking. He knows what makes you tick. He knows the kind of humor. He knows the jokes. He knows the sarcasm. He knows what's meaningful to you. You know that the, that the Rav Desta writes, there is a Yetzirah of Ruchnius. There is a Yetzirah of spirituality. And the Yetzirah will come with all of his emotions and he'll grab your heart. He'll pull it in different directions. You'll find yourself crying and you'll be introspective and you'll think the world is so profound. And it's really the Yetzirah that's coming to grab you away from your Amuna, to grab you away from a life of Yiddishkeit, a life that is redeeming in the eyes of Hashem. But it feels so right. How could you tell me that it's wrong? It feels so right inside of me. The answer is because that is what the Yetzirah does. He confuses us and he confounds us and he restricts our mind from thinking in the right way and it, it jades our vision so that we don't, we don't really see what it is that we are looking at. Says the mob, be careful. You got to be on guard. Because if a person is not the Yetzirah, it's just going to slip right into your mind. He's going to enter into the canals of your heart He's going to start to be machish, to uh, oppose and to weaken your basic, simple amuna pshuta that you live with all of your life. If a person in any way is struggling in their amuna, the Yitzhar just comes in and just knocks them down a little bit more and a little bit more. And then it is hopeless, says the Malbim, very, very hard to escape from such a place. Says <clears throat> Rav Hirsch on these words over here. And he says the following, number one, going back to the second verse, and he says, Neum Pesha, what does it mean over here that it is the Neum, it is the pronouncement of Hashem? What the Yetzirah is the pronouncement, what, is it, what does this mean? So he says a fascinating idea, and that he says that the, <coughs> the sins that a person does, it seems to be the pronouncement, the declaration of HaKadosh Baruch Himself. How can my sins be something that Hashem is declaring that I should do? And he writes like this, because whenever there, a person is tempted to sin, he tells himself the following. Now, you think about these words. He's like, no, no, I don't say that. Think about these words the next time the person sins. And he says like this. He says that if HaKadosh Baruch is, all, is omnipotent, He's all-powerful and He's all-knowing, and he didn't really desire any evil because Hashem is the source. He's all good. Hashem is all good, right? That's what we say. Hashem is all good. Everything that he does is good. He doesn't have a trace of evil inside of him. 
So then, if that's who HaKadosh Baruch Hu really is, then he certainly could have prevented by making, he could, he could have prevented us from wanting to do evil by making it very unattractive. And the, the less attractive that evil is, so then I wouldn't even be drawn to such a thing. It happens to be that everything in the world that is evil, so many things that are there, which is a, a lot of stuff that is based upon our desires and the lust and the, and the like, those things are so attractive. Those things are so pleasurable. Those things are so riveting and they pique my curiosity. HaKadosh Baruch, if you don't want me to do evil, why would you make evil so tantalizing in this world? Why would you do that? Elamai says Rev Hirsch over here, since that HaKadosh Baruch Hu did nothing at all seemingly to prevent me from indulging in a life of evil, it must be then that he thinks that both the very urge to do wrong and that which a person feels within himself and the clear way which he sees it before him in order to execute his plan of evil attack over here. Again, this is the person themselves. It's Naum, it's a proclamation that HaKadosh Baruch has made showing that what Hashem himself approves of my wrongdoing. Which means it's not, there's nothing wrong. It, why would HaKadosh Baruch Hu give me the opportunity to do a sin? Why would he made me with this propensity for certain sins over other ones? It must be that there's really nothing that is wrong with it. And I could actually trick myself into thinking that really HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants me to do this sin. You know why? Because it's not a sin. There's nothing wrong with it. If there was something wrong with it, HaKadosh Baruch Hu wouldn't have made it so enjoyable. It was something wrong with it. He wouldn't have made it so easy to access and to get to. So it must be then, says, the, says Rev Hirsch, that a person will begin to think to themselves that the fact that I am drawn after sin and there's seemingly nothing getting in my way to stop me right now, that is an exclamation of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, which is proclaiming to us, go for it, it's all yours, you have nothing to worry about. This is how twisted the Yetzirah is. The Yetzirah is so twisted and then we believe it. That's the problem over here. Like the Malbim is saying and the, and the Rav Hirsch is saying, we're, we're so much greater than that thought process. Our minds are supposed to be running with purity and with straightness and Kedusha and holiness. And we could fall for such a foolish argument of the Yetzirah, which is what? Now, well, if you have a desire to do sin, and nothing is really getting in your way, it must really be that it's a good thing to do. Well, wait a second. But the Torah says not to do it. You're worrying about what it says in the Torah? If HaKadosh Baruch Hu wanted the Torah to be real, wouldn't he have given us more help to get there? Wouldn't he have made it easier to keep the 613 taxing laws that the Torah has on top of us? So the fact that it's so hard... It is so difficult every single day to be a good Jew and be diligent in the work that we're doing. That And it's so easy to sin and get drawn in. That must be a proof that HaKadosh Baruch Hu really is not what we thought that he was. It must be a proof that there's really nothing wrong with doing the wrong, doing sinful behavior. Because if there was, Hashem would have made it much more difficult. I just want to go back to the marshal, the parable of the person who goes into the gym to work out. If a person is out of shape, they're like the shape of an isosceles triangle or uh, the circumference of, of a gigantic circle. So, and they know that it's not healthy. Everybody knows that it's not healthy to eat and to have the wrong foods and to be 20, 30, 40, 50 pounds overweight. Everybody knows that already. So you say to yourself, well, if it was... Uh, if it's not healthy, so then why would, why would Hashem make it so hard to get into shape? Must be a sign that I don't have to get into shape. Nobody would say that. They would just say, I'm lazy. I can't pick myself up off the couch. I try every week. I try to go on another diet, another diet, another diet. It's so hard. I can't do it. I'm too lazy to go to the gym and work out. And I find So I buy myself a Stairmaster. And then it just sits in the corner of my house. I just never get on top of it. Ah, you know, it's, I'm, I'm not in the mood today. I'm not in the mood today. Ten years later, I just never was in the mood, so I never worked on it. So it, it doesn't make sense that a person is going to say, well, since I see that it's so hard to exercise and work out and keep my mouth closed from all the food, therefore that must be a sign that I'm just supposed to be out of shape. No. 
I'm going to tell you I just like eating and I'm too lazy and I'm not interested in working out. That's the bottom line. But there are people that say, wait a second, I got to take the bull by the horns over here. I can't allow myself just to go on for the rest of my life out of shape or in a shape that I'd rather not be in. And so therefore, yes, it will require Monsieur's nefesh hard work. It means I'm going to have to buckle down and do the right thing. I'm going to watch what I eat. Maybe I'll count my calories. I'll weigh my food. I'll go to a nutritionist. I have to exercise 20 minutes a day, half an hour a day, an hour a day, whatever it might be, in order to retain a healthy, positive approach to life. Am I wrong for doing that? No, that's the only way you can get there. So the Yitzhar comes along to a person and says, listen, it's so easy to sin. If HaKadosh Baruch Hu didn't want you to sin, He would have made it much harder. He would have made the sin far away from you. He would have made you with a less desire to do the sin. He would have made the sin so, so curious and so, 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 so looking so good. He wouldn't have done that. But the fact that HaKadosh Baruch Hu made it so simple, obviously He wants you to sin. Really, Yitzhahara? Maybe what HaKadosh Baruch Hu is saying is that if you want to become great in spirituality, you want to become great as an Evan Hashem, a servant of Hashem, you got to work hard. And that's the only way that a person is going to accomplish and to achieve. And yet the Yitzhar is so sneaky and so tricky. And again, he speaks our language. He knows what we like to hear. He knows how to reason with us. We end up falling into the trap when we believe the foolishness of the ridiculous remarks and tricks and persuasion of the Yitzhahara, which is just a, it, it's nothing, it's, it's, it's hot air, it's dust, it's pixie dust, there's nothing there, it's going to fly away. And yet, we end up falling in to the traps of the Yitzhahara. <laughs> Why, says Rav Hirsch? So he says, the care of Libi, he says there's no room for the fear of Hashem's judgment in the heart of the wicked man or his calculations. And he has no pachad, he has no fear in front of his eyes. And therefore he decides, I'll do whatever I want in my life. And this is the same idea as the other reforshim over here, which is that the person that is consumed by the Yetzirah, he just, he checked out on Amuna. Uh, again, going all the way back to the beginning of time. The, the beginning of time is, Adam Harishan comes into the world and within several hours of his existence he breaks the one cardinal sin. Don't eat from the tree of knowledge and good and evil. Hashem says you ate from it, now I have to punish you. What's the punishment? Expelled from the Gan Eden, from the Garden of Eden. You're gonna, death is going to come to you right now. In order to make a livelihood, you're going to have to work very hard. A woman's going to have childbirth and it's going to be painful as could be. None of that was supposed to happen in the world before. Those were the consequences of the actions of man's mistake. So from Pasuk number one, basically, in the Torah, we have the concepts of reward and punishment which means that a person should actually have a little bit of fear and awe, basic fear and awe, to make sure they don't make a mistake. And yet the Yitzhar comes along and says, ah, don't worry about that. Why do you think Adam sinned? Because it says in the Pasuk, the fruit was pleasing to his eyes. It was misavi, he had a taiva, a desire for it. If Hashem didn't want him to eat from it, he would not have, he wouldn't have made it look so good. Yeah, but Yitzhahorah, the result was man got punished. So obviously he doesn't want to eat from it. Okay, that's a technicality, says the Sahara. Furthermore, says the, says the Rav Hirsch over here. In the next verse, like we said, and that is that his eyes are smoothing out the pathways for him. Limsav, you know, he'll be able to find his sin. Lisnoi, what does it mean, the hatred over here? Says the says Rav Hirsch that he, there's, the way to look at it is this, along these lines. God is the one that smoothed out the path for him to vent his hatred upon any person who stands in the way of his sinful goals. Meaning, once that I see that what it's so easy to sin and fall into the traps of the Yetzirah, and HaKadosh Baruch Hu, obviously he set it up like that. I mean, why would he make it so easy? Obviously he wants it to be that way. So anybody who stands in my way, meaning any relative who's like super religious, 
any spouse who's more religious than I am, any child who goes to school and he learns all these teachings of the of Midrashim and Chazal and the Torah, and he comes home to his parents, Shabbos, and says, hey, you're not allowed to do that. Any rub that gets up in public in his, in his shul and shir, or he gives a drasha, or he's on torahanytime.com and he's giving musa left and right over the way that people are behaving. So, hey, you got to get out of my way over here. Well, you think you're greater than God? HaKadosh Baruch Hu made the pathway smooth. He made it so easy to fall into sin. And you're telling me not to right now? Listen, so he says, David HaMelech over here, this person now has been gripped by the chains of the Yitzhahara, He's going to come to despise anyone that gets in his way. That's why you see there's people that they just turn off at a certain point. They can't hear the words of the Torah. They cannot hear the words of our Chazal. They cannot listen to their friend who's talking about Torah is so amazing. It's, it's unbelievable. Wow, I'm struggling with this Yitzhar, but I'm going to conquer it. I'm going to overcome it. And the guy's saying to himself, what are you talking about? Just give in. Just give in. What are you worried about? Hashem made it so easy. And anyone that stands in the way, they will incur the wrath of such a person. Says the Pasuk further, Divrei Piv Oven Umirma. The words in the mouth over here of the Rosh or the Yetzahara, maybe we'll call it, are filled with, with oven, with violence, umirma and deceit. Chadola Askelative. And he ceases to apply his mind to doing that which is good. Once that the Yetzahara has grabbed me in, in all in all shapes, realms, and form. So then the person says, listen, I'm game over already. I, I have a desire to do good. I'm very happy with doing what I'm doing over here. Says, the, says, the Rav, Her, says Rav Hirsch, every word that a person says will end up creating and serving the purpose of continued I, perverted ideas and view of the world and what it is that we're doing over here. And it's mirma, it's completely deceitful. And a person will use his speech, and you find this very often. Somebody who's doing the wrong thing, he's not usually quiet about it. He's usually has to justify and explain again and again and again why what I'm doing is the right thing, why what you're doing is the wrong thing, why this is the right way for a person to live, and that's, what I, that's really what I, what I want to do. And it's clear as day like that, because like the Malbim says, you can't bring me any proofs anyway that Hashem is watching and He's doing it all around. Why are you talking so much? Just go do what you want to do. Why do you have to talk about it so much? Because the words solidify a person's in immersion into that world of sin. The words, the more that I talk, I actually start to believe the things that I'm saying. So that when I'm doing something that is wrong, I convince myself as well, there's nothing wrong with what I'm doing. I've got proofs for you from nature, from the world, from God's lack of existence over here, the fact that He doesn't, I can't hear, see all these different things. So the more that I talk about it, the more the hot air that's coming out of my mouth, it's creating strength in my mind to think in a certain way. And what's chadol? What does it mean over here that I'm going to cease from wanting to do good? Says Rav Hirsch, from the, the, this, the fact that his mind, his intelligence, his brains, his intellect has been now captured by the Yetzirah, he checked out already a long time ago in using his mind to do maizim to, do, to do good deeds. He's not interested right now. Every once in a while, I have like some here or tshuva, he'll feel a little bit, maybe I should do more. And there he'll, that today he'll do something a little bit better. But in general, the checking out from the world of Torah, checking out from the world of real Amun and Baruch, it, it happens in such a way that a person is convinced beyond the shadow that what I'm, whatever I'm doing is right. I have nothing to worry about. HaKadosh Baruch just made it such a smooth, easy transition. Now, Let's not think that we're talking about the person who's like completely off the derech of Torah and mitzvahs. Let's just talk about ourselves, okay? Let's say we're Oshom Shabbos, we keep Shabbos, we try to be diligent in the laws of Lashon Hara, we try to keep all the laws of Kashrus and we make brachas and the like, but yet there are areas in everyone's life that we know that we are weak in. And those areas of spiritual weakness and the only reason that we're not getting better in that area is because we already fell into the trappings of the Yetzirah. He convinced us, you're okay. 
don't worry about it. If it was supposed to be, if you're supposed to do it, it would not be so hard to be able to grasp this concept, this mitzvah, or to guard yourself from this particular taiva, this desire. And therefore, all of us, in our observance, in the things that we are doing, we all have momentary lapses of reasoning where we just, we don't realize. We don't even realize that's how much the Yitzhar has gotten us and convinced us that it's okay to do the wrong thing. And I'll finish with the next verse. Oven a person lies in his bed at night and he thinks about sinful things. And he says, I'm just going to keep going down the wrong path. And, he, and he's not disgusted. He does not scorn ra evil. So the, so the, uh, the Rav Hirsch writes over here that the man's entire life this is really the Russia, the Russia, the big, the really wicked person. This person's whole life is immersed and enmeshed in evil. That means even when he's in his bed, the bed is the end of the day already. I, if I worked hard, I'm exhausted by the time I'm laying there in my bed. And it's the way that a, a, a person be able just to gather his strength and get himself ready for the next day. What is this person thinking about? He's thinking about, I was involved with evil and, and, and sinful things all day long. I can't wait for another day where I'll be able to accomplish even more in that realm. And therefore he's planning, while he's lying on his bed, he's planning, he's plotting, what I'm going to do from the moment I wake up the next morning. And, uh, and also he writes, if there's any unforeseen evil opportunities on his pathways, so he says, you know what, I'll hop around, I'll grab that one as well. The wicked man, says Ravers, believes that the world belongs to the strong and to the mighty, who don't pay any heed to the pangs of the consciousness that is there. Which means the, the conscious of a person really is the nisham of that person crying out and saying, hey, please, don't do that. I'd rather do the right thing. But a Russia that we're describing over here, he says, no, no, no. The world belongs to the men of might, to the people of strength, who they, they push out the guilt feelings that are inside of them to make sure they can keep doing the right, the, what they want to do. And they're at the hands of whose ruthless violence all weak and powerless will perish. They believe that anyone who's weak, weak means someone that wants to be an Eved Hashem. Somebody who wants to do the will of Hashem, who's willing to put his neck on the line for doing the right thing over the wrong thing, those people aren't going to make it. Pukhazi, take a look in the world. How many times have the Jewish people suffered at the hands of our enemies? How many times have the Jewish people gone through gullahs, through exiles, which are so painful and murderous, and oh, these are the great people, the great sages of the Jewish people who pushed themselves to do the will of Hashem. Says the Yitzhahara to this person, I'm trying to prove to you that if you follow the path of the righteous, you're just going to get engulfed in flames. But if you listen to me and you realize HaKadosh Baruch is not watching, he doesn't know what's going on, he's certainly not going to give reward and punishment and all the like, and you thought the mitzvahs were for your benefit, they're not really for your benefit. It's, it's hard. It's painful to be able to give up the things that you like for the sake of God. That's not for your benefit. That causes pain. That causes oppression. I am, I, what's, what's the word over there? A person not oppressing their, their thing, but they're suppressing. I have to suppress myself for the sake of Hashem? I can't do that. Rubbish. Rubbish, the words of the Yitzhahara, hot air and rubbish. And Be'ez Hashem next week as we go through the second half of this Tehillim and we see how David HaMelech challenges the Yitzhahara and all of his claims, how David HaMelech challenges the Rishoyim and shows why it is that we should be in Evan Hashem, then it will give us the strength as well to understand how to live a life that is moving in the glory of Hashem and not, God forbid, getting trapped by the chains and the nets of the Yitzhahara. Have a wonderful day, strong week, Be'ez Hashem, and we'll see you next Sunday. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. A good